Okay, thank you for joining everybody. I'm talking today about the importance of forgiveness. And starting in Genesis 4 verses 1 through 8, um, you see Adam knew his wife Eve, she conceived and bare Cain, and then right after that she had Abel. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. Now that's important. Cain came to bring an offering to God. But we see that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins because the life of the flesh is in the blood and you have to pour that out um, as a compensation for your own life. That's why God had, had people sacrifice animals in the past. An innocent animal would die in your place. And it, would all, it was all foreshadowing what Jesus would do for us as our sacrificial lamb. So when he brought produce to God, there was no, there was no life, there was no blood, there was no life in it. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't count because there was no blood to shed. So God rejected Cain's offering, but it says Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But to Cain and his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. He was upset that he didn't get accepted. And then he assumably became bitter towards his brother whose sacrifice was accepted. Now God warns him. He says, The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So God's warning him here. He's saying you have to get a hold of your heart. Um, you cannot let this anger and this wrath stay in you because it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a default state that God created people for, right? And Cain allowed that to stay in there and to metastasize and to grow and to get worse. And verse 8, And Cain talked with, his, with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So you see that that anger and that bitterness and that that um that's just that hatred that he ended up developing towards his brother god warned him against it he didn't take control of his heart and it ended up getting to the point where he murdered his brother and if you <clears throat> if you hold unforgiveness in your heart or it's say any negative emotion it could be bitterness wrath envy um depression any of those things that we weren't created for it rots you it kills you and <laughs> it ends up destroying you it can destroy your heart your life your joy your peace your ministry your marriage your family your your church whatever it is it can destroy and it brings death in some manner um <clears throat> in this case it resulted in a literal death cain ended up killing his own brother um, the first murder in history. And that, that's because he didn't get a grip on his heart and his emotions. In James 1.15, it says, when lust, now I'm going to say that this applies to any kind of wrong desire or, or, or passion or anything that isn't from God. When it hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So you see God's warning. If you allow bad things in your heart to conceive, that everything bears fruit. Is it bearing fruit towards God or is it bearing like sin and corruption and things you weren't created for, which results in death? Remember Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. A wage is something you deserve. It's something you earn. And when you, when you go and sin, you deserve death. You earn that wage, right? And that's why we need a propitiation, a sacrifice for our sins to save us. And that's Jesus. Um, and when sin conceives, it brings forth death. In this case, a literal death with Cain and Abel, but it could also be a death, like I said, in a relationship or a ministry or, or in, in all these different areas of your life. In Matthew 18, Jesus gives another warning. Um, talking about... Uh, a, a, talking about... A, 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 I'll, I'll just read the whole thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's a verses 23, say, to 35. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. That's a lot of money. Back, like back then, that's like probably millions of dollars now. I don't, I don't know the exact amount offhand. But, um, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment be, to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. God is so e eager and willing to forgive if we're sincere and we come to him um, <clears throat> and forgave him the debt. But the same servant, the same guy went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. So that's like barely anything in comparison. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, 
O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, that massive debt he owed, because thou desiredst me. Shouldst thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant and have, had, and have had pity on thee, even as I have had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my Father in heaven do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So you see that because that guy, he, he, he asked forgiveness, he received it, but then he didn't reciprocate it. He didn't give forgiveness to others. And you think that we owe a massive debt as human beings. We, each person owes a massive debt towards God for the sin and all the bad things that we've done. And God is able and willing to forgive all of it if you just come to him in sincerity. And once you're forgiven all of that, why are we then holding on to, to, to relatively small things? It might seem big to you, but it's small compared to what God forgives us. Why are we holding on to that towards these different people in our lives? People that have hurt you or wronged you. It might be a perceived wrong or it might have been something terrible, but why are we holding on to that? If God forgave us all this debt, why are we holding on to those little things? And you see here that in this case, this guy was given to the tormentors. If you stay in unforgiveness, it torments you. It brings, it, it's a place of torment because you're not, when you're in unforgiveness and you're, and you're angry with somebody, they might be having the time of their life. They're having a great time. They're not, it's not affecting them at all. It's only affecting you. It's only negatively impacting you, not them. So you're not getting them back. You shouldn't be seeking revenge anyways, but it's not fixing anything and it's a place of torment and you're not, it's going to produce death. It's not going to produce life. You're not going to have an abundant life. It's going to hold you back. It's going to rob your peace, rob your joy. And like I said, eventually it can end up corrupting and ruining other areas of your life and other relationships and things as well. And Jesus is warning against that. Don't hold on to unforgiveness. Now there are times where you have a physical problem or an infirmity of some kind because you're holding on to negativity. You're holding on to unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, wrath, jealousy, the whole nine yards, depression. If you hold on to those things, it can impact your body in a negative way. Um, <clears throat> you think when people are stressed, your body can actually, in extreme cases, leach calcium from your bones because calcium is needed for muscle contractions, for your heart, for your muscles, for all that. And when you're going through stress and all those things, sorry, loud truck. Uh, sounds nice, but um, when you're going through those things, your body thinks, hey, you're in an extreme situation, you need calcium for your muscles, it takes calcium out of your bones, <laughs> and it, it starts to rot your bones. Um, in Proverbs 14.30, it says, a sound heart is the, light of, is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. When you're in negativity, it, rot, it corrupts your body. People who are depressed, who are angry, who are bitter, they statistically tend to live a few years shorter on average. People who are happy, who have peace, who are relaxed, they tend to live a little longer because the negative emotions negatively impacts your life and your, and your quality of life. Proverbs 17.22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth up the bones. And you cannot have a merry heart if you're holding unforgiveness. If you want health in, in your body, there's one guy... I was listening to, um, he's a paramedic and he prays for people and he sees tons of people get healed. And one thing he's realized is that sometimes he'll be praying for people, but he's not seeing the healing. And he asks them, do you have um, like unforgiveness or any of these kinds of negative things in your life? And when they're honest and they say, well, yeah, I have this and this and this, um, he'll help walk them through repenting of that and, and letting it go and, and forgiving and letting it go. And he says so many times those people end up getting better. <laughs> a lot of the times the, the negative problems uh, that we have in our health, that could be caused by, by holding on to unforgiveness or bitterness or any of those things. So I'm saying this to encourage you that you cannot let these things stay in your heart. Your heart was not created to hold these things. You think that when people, when they're in like, uh, it's like a police or, or in the military and they go through really traumatic events, they get PTSD from all the things they're exposed to, the things that they, they, they end up doing. People who work in slaughterhouses oftentimes get PTSD too. It's, it's not something you're created for. You're not created for death and negativity. When people are sacrificial and selfless and, and they're giving and they're helping others, it's extremely fulfilling. It brings joy. It brings life and, and not just life to you, but for other people as well. That's what we were created for. The things that make you thrive are the things that you're created for. I'm not talking about your base passions and all those things. I'm talking about things like selflessness, like love, the things that God calls us to. And I'm not speaking in a general sense. I'm speaking as Christians. Um, <clears throat> this is the stuff we were created for, not for negativity. You cannot hold on to it because you're only hurting yourself. But by extension, you'll end up impacting other people as well. Um, as Christians, we are called to forgive and to forbear one another in love. 
in Romans 12, 19, it says, avenge not yourselves. Vengeance is mine, not vengeance is fine. <laughs> One pastor said that. Um, not vengeance is fine, but vengeance is mine, saith God. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's up to God. You don't have to seek that. Colossians 3.13 says, forbearing one another, one another. It means enduring one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And God has completely and entirely forgiven us as Christians. So we are called therefore to forgive one another and to forbear with them in love, just like God forbears us, his children, in love. Ephesians 4 verses 2 and 32 says, similarly, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is what we're called to. And just as Christ, <coughs> sorry, that was weird. Throat got dry. And just as Christ forgave us as Christians, um, we need to understand that we are a forgiven people. We're not a people that needs to constantly seek forgiveness in order to be in right stand, uh, in order to be right with God. So in say John, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Some people would see that as meaning every time I sin, I have to go to God to get forgiven or else I'm not going to be right with God. Now, you should absolutely, let me make this clear, whenever you do something wrong, when you sin, when you mess up and you realize it or it's brought to your attention, you should absolutely repent and, and seek forgiveness. But God is not going to cut you off and send you to hell if you don't, okay? Because we are completely forgiven. First John chapter 1 was written to address Gnosticism. Gnosticism was like a kind of what you would call like a new age mentality. They didn't believe that Jesus came in the flesh or that there was any such thing as, as sin, um, at least not in the physical world. So John, in 1 John 1, he's saying, we saw him with our eyes, we touched him with our hands, um, and, and he's, he's addressing the fact that he was here in a literal body, because Gnosticism was coming into the early church right off the bat. It, in some areas, like Alexandria and others, it was coming in. So um, he addressed that. He said, if you, ha if you say you have no sin, again, addressing Gnosticism, if you say you have no sin, then the truth is not in you, and you're calling God a liar. And when you get to verse 9, he says, if you confess your sins, if you're willing to acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you need God's forgiveness and, and to be saved by Jesus, then he is faithful and just to cleanse us, to forgive you, and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. All means all. That's when you're forgiven. That's your salvation experience. All means everything. It means your past, your present, and your future. And your future has to be included in the word all, because all means everything. You're also forgiven of the sins you were aware of, the sins you're not aware of, the sins you, you forgot about, the sins you remember, everything, the big, the small, it's all forgiven when you're saved in Christ. And when you get to chapter 2, verse 12, um, it says, I write to you, John says, little children, because your sins are forgiven, past tense, they are forgiven you for his name's sake. When you're in Christ, you are a forgiven person. That doesn't mean you go off and, and you free reign to go out and sin and do all that stuff. That's hyper grace. It's completely unscriptural. I do not preach or teach or encourage it at all. Um, but you just know that you are a forgiven person. When my, when my kids do something wrong, when they break something or they, they do something bad, I'll forgive them in my heart before they ever come to me. I'll, before they ever ask for forgiveness, I can forgive them. And I, I should and I will forgive them. They should still come and ask forgiveness and set things right or else the relationship gets kind of funked up and it's, 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 it's not good, right? You want to have an open, clear, humble heart before God. If you're saying, oh, I don't need to, I don't need to apologize, and then you're, you're, that's pride and that will, that's a hard heart and then that leads into a whole bad area. It can ruin your life. Um, you have to have a humble heart. You have to stay open to God and say, okay, God, I was wrong. I, need, I apologize. But know though, know that he has already forgiven you. I hope this is clear because I don't want people to misunderstand. He has already forgiven you as a Christian. Um, so you don't have to walk around thinking like, oh, I didn't repent of this or that. Or God's going to turn his back on me. No, he isn't here his child. But do you know that as a forgiven person, you should still seek, seek um, to apologize and make things right with God whenever or with anyone else whenever you do things wrong. In Hebrews 1.3, it says, when he, Jesus... Um, had by himself, and I love that because that's how powerful Jesus' sacrifice, his blood was, by himself, one, one man, God in flesh, by himself purged our sins, the sins of all humanity for anyone who's willing to, to accept him. When he purged, past tense, our sins, so we are purged, we are cleansed by his sacrifice on the cross. 
he sat down, and this is important, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Because in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the priests were not allowed to have chairs or stools with them. They could not sit down on the job. They were always on their feet, always making sacrifices, because there was always something that needed forgiving. And this is important, because you have to discern who's being spoken to here. Um, I'll jump first to Hebrews 8, verses 12 and 13. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, God says, and, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So he's, he's already, if you're in Christ, he has cleansed you, purged you, and he's not remembering your sins or iniquities anymore. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. And in Hebrews, you see that God made a new covenant because he found fault with the old one, with what Israel had. And so he made a new covenant. He didn't fix, amend, or add to the old one. It says he made a brand new covenant founded upon better promises. And that's what we have in Jesus Christ. So when you see Jesus in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, and Mark 11, 25 to 26, Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to a Jewish audience who at that time was living under the law, the law of Moses. And you see in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, that Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, and he lived his whole life, his whole ministry under the law to redeem them that were under the law. So Jesus' death, it wasn't just to save us as Christians. He also redeemed everyone up to that point who put their faith in God. Through, from Adam to Moses to right up to, to his death. Everybody who had put their faith in a, in a future Messiah and they made animal sacrifices in the meantime, his, his sacrifice covered all of it. Okay, he's covered them all. But under the old covenant, it was a conditional system. If they didn't make animal sacrifices in faith for the sins they had committed, they would they, then they would be in, an, in a state of unforgiveness. And they had to keep making sacrifice after, after, after sacrifice, week after week, for their whole life. And, and to that crowd, Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Because they were under a conditional system. As Christians, we are forgiven. Even if we don't seek forgiveness, we are still forgiven. That is, that's what... Um, Hebrews 1, 3, what 1 John 1, 9, 1 John 2, 12, and a whole bunch of other things. Like, like Ephesians 4, verses 2 and 32, Colossians 3, 13 that I read, they all say to forgive as Christ forgave us, past tense. We are a forgiven, cleansed people. Here's the thing. If you think that you need to, get, to be forgiven by Jesus every single time you sin, that means you need blood every single time you sin. Because Hebrews 9, 22 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So if you want your sins to be cleansed, you need to shed blood. Jesus shed his blood one time, one time. And that was powerful enough for all, for all, for people in the past that put their faith in him before they died. And for anyone who accepted Jesus as Messiah, um, like for us in the church. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. His blood was powerful enough. It doesn't need to be offered over and over and over again. It was a one-time sacrifice. Do you understand that? A one-time sacrifice, and that cleanses us. Um, so discern who's, who's being spoken to, because when you read those words of Jesus, you're going to think that they apply to the church, and you're going to get freaked out and think you have to get Jesus' blood applied to you over and over and over again. You don't. You need it one time. But we should still seek forgiveness whenever we do make mistakes. Have humility, you know? Um, in Ephesians 1.7, and it says the same thing in Colossians 1.14, um, speaking of Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Again, he has completely covered us by his blood. We are a forgiven people in Christ. And we have a God who eagerly wants to forgive us. In Isaiah 1.18, you see God reasoning. And this is, again, Old Testament, but it's still the heart of God. He says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He's saying, I can forgive you so easily, I can cleanse you. Just come to me, let me do it. God can't forgive you if you don't turn to him. So, you think when the man was lowered through the roof in front of Jesus, in that house, in that crowd, it doesn't even say that the man asked Jesus for forgiveness. But he, Jesus knew that man had a heart that was desiring and that was seeking him. It recognized him <laughs> for who he was. And Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. God is so eager to forgive. Jesus wants to forgive us. In Luke 23, 34, when Jesus is being nailed to the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was even forgiving the people nailing him to the cross and they didn't even ask for forgiveness. I'm not saying that that was a salvation, but forgiving them of, the, of, those, of that sin of nailing him to the cross. 
that if that's the heart of Jesus, then why aren't we pursuing that? Why are we holding on to tr relatively trivial things? If Jesus can forgive people nailing him to the cross, we can forgive people for the wrong they've done to us. Um, and I know I would say, well, you don't know what I've been through. Like, yeah, but what about what Jesus went through? Right? Like we have to get past ourselves, let ourselves go, let our hurt stop, let it go and, and die to ourselves so that we, when, when you're dead to yourself, you're not going to care anymore. And then you can start forgiving and loving other people and living the way that Christ calls us to. And Psalm 103 verses 11 and 12 says, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. When he is forgiving you, those things are gone. He does not look at you and say, oh, look at this sinner. <laughs> he's not. As a Christian, as a child of God in Christ, he's saying, this is my son or my daughter that I have cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Their sins and their iniquities I remember no more. They are forgiven and they are, they are mine. They are, they are secure in me. They are saved. And, and that is what God looks at. Now, again, I say this a million times, when you sin, you do need to go to God and apologize and set things right and have a humble heart. I um, heard this analogy. I don't know if I said it last week, but I heard this analogy um, in a commentary that God is like the sun and people are like clay and wax. The same sunshine will shine on clay and wax. It hardens the clay, but it melts the wax. Why does it harden one and melt the other? It's not the, the fault of the sun. The sun is just the sun. The, the, reason, the reason why one hardens and one melts is because of the material itself. Now, we as people, if you have a hard heart towards God, when, when you're exposed to that sun, that truth, it, it just hardens you even more sometimes. But if, if you have a, a humble heart, you're like the wax where you're saying, okay, I was wrong. Melt, his light will melt you, mold you. You can mold and shape and form wax once it's liquid, right? So God can work with that. <laughs> but, but if you choose and you have free will in this, you choose if you want to hold on to things in your heart or if you want to open up and let God in. But if you choose to have a hard heart, then you'll be hardened by the truth. But if you have a humble, open heart, then you, he can work with that. He can forgive. He can cleanse you and mold you and conform you to the image of his son like we're predestined for. So, um, and that, again, that word predestined is if we are predestined as believers who put their, who use their free will to choose Christ, you are predestined to be like Jesus. And that will be finished one day when we stand before him. Um, but we do have free will in the process. So I hope this encouraged you. I hope it helped you guys. Don't be like Cain. Don't hold on to bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, or envy or anything like that. Because in, in the end, it brings forth death. Like you saw with Cain. Unforgiveness becomes a place of torment like Jesus warned about, do not allow yourself to hold, to hold on to that. You have to choose to let that go and to forgive. That sometimes you get infirmities and physical problems because you're holding on to negativity and unforgiveness and such. We are called to forgive and forbear one another as Christ forgave and forbears us. That as Christians, we are a forgiven people. A forgiven people and walk in that freedom, that peace that it brings, knowing that you're that you've been already cleansed by God. It, it takes so much burden, weight, and stress off of you. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you are feeling weighed down, it's because you're not carrying his burden. You're taking it on yourself, something that he has already done. Or you're trying to make something happen that he wants to provide the, the means and the strength for. Or you're not following what he's called you to, any of those. <laughs> but discern who's being spoken to when Jesus talks about forgiveness in Matthew and Mark. Um, discern who's being spoken to and the dispensations, the covenants that we're in. Um, and that we have a God who eagerly wants to forgive us. He wants to cleanse us. So come to him for salvation. Come to him for forgiveness and redemption. And know that as Christians, as believers in Christ, when you do something wrong, apologize to God, get it right. But know that he has already even forgiven you. He is that good. And when you understand his goodness, the goodness of God calls men to repentance. It makes you want to have a change of heart. That's what repentance is. A change of heart. A change of, 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 of um, belief or value. So... Um, I hope this encouraged you guys. Uh, again, forgiveness is crucial. Don't hold on to unforgiveness. Accept what Jesus has done and walk in a state of forgiveness. I hope this blessed you guys. I hope it helped you guys. Um, thank you. God bless. And I'll see you guys next week.